بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سو اکارڈنگ ٹو دا سجیشن میڈ لاسٹ ٹائم آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو چینج دا ٹائٹل آف دس کورس آئی ہیو ڈن دس بٹ اٹ ول بی کالڈ انٹروڈکٹری اسٹیٹسٹکس اینڈ اسلامک اپروچ دیٹ وی ول ناٹ اٹ ول ناٹ اپیئر ٹو بی اینی ریسٹرکٹیڈ ٹو مسلم آڈینس بٹ اٹ ڈسکرائبز مور ایکوریٹلی وٹ آئی ایم ٹرائنگ ٹو ڈو So now, um, the question that will automatically arise in the mind of everybody is okay, why should it be for Muslim students or what difference does the Islamic approach make? Why, there are many related questions here. One is that Of course, statistics was invented in the West. And so, um, obviously, they should know better how to teach it. And so, if they are teaching it, why not just follow them? They are the originators of the subject. And there are related questions that actually there is a secular mindset it will interest you to know that this secular mindset was not yani it has not been there forever actually in the 16th and 17th century europe was just as deeply religious as the rest of the world and when some people said that there are some areas of knowledge which religion has nothing to say about this was strongly resisted many people said no this is wrong this cannot be religion is all comprehensive it governs every aspect of life and there is nothing which is beyond the scope of religion so mm-hmm. but it was a battle of ideas for two centuries in which eventually the secular point of view prevailed and they said that there are areas of knowledge which are outside the reach of religion. They are just technical, they have nothing to do with religion. They are objective, they are fact. Now if I say that this is a table, this is a table. What does religion have to say about this? So similarly, factual, objective, concrete things are not uh, subject to religion so this is the whole idea of secularity the secular thinking means that there are two two aspects of our life two aspects of our knowledge they are completely separated from each other there is the religion which deals with our inner personal spiritual life and about which i am free to do what i want and you are free and there is not to be much communication in fact one of the Basically, you see, the idea of secular thinking arose from certain historical experiences in the West. This is very important to understand. It's not that this is something which was logically and rationally discovered. It was just that in the West there was a huge amount of fighting among different religions. The Catholics really did a lot of massive amount of cruelty and torture to Protestants. and the, when the protestants got the chance they took their revenge so people got the idea that religion is just about fighting each other and so uh, they said well first of all we should not talk about religion because it leads to fights and also that if we want to have a society you see initially the idea was that society should be based on religion but which religion catholicism protestantism and in the protestant there are many different factions and they all disagree with each other so they said no that means that society cannot be founded on religion we must found it on some rational logical principles which are acceptable to everybody and religion is not so then the idea came that okay that um, the, there are certain domains of knowledge which are 
purely outside the reach of religion and these are the domains which we will use for our common discussions privately we can talk about religion but in public we cannot talk about religion because it will cause a fight so all of these are ideas which are deeply implanted in when you read the books from the west whether it's a novel or whether it's a textbook these ideas are there in the background and they are exposed in many different ways uh, you don't actually it's like the foundation it's not actually openly discussed because it's everybody assumes it's true but these ideas get through to you 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 also absorb this understanding without actually uh, being explicit so the first job that i am facing here is why should we have an islamic approach so what is the answer to, to this question that you have understood from the lecture now should we have an islamic approach what are the characteristics what are the features which make an islamic approach to teaching statistics different from the western approach not just statistics actually all of education is affected by this but i am so um, what do you understand from this that what are the basic uh, differentiating features of an islamic approach to teaching and learning yes open for faria you seem to have something okay as a from your lecture and statistics i'm giving an answer so they i understood that they um the same sort of problem of logical problem in the high end uh statistics of the discipline as well so whereas uh we have a speaker hai i think this is being live streamed so agar speaker hota to ye baat bhi ha le hai meanwhile okay go ahead so whereas um, before uh, just well, or how it should just have been taught normally is that you are doing certain numbers and stuff and uh, uh, the analysis on the one hand that is the job of somebody else and the other thing is um i think the example of the the nuclear uh, that you used sort of somebody making the nuclear technology uh, not being connected with how it's going to be used so the whole question of um, knowledge and what purpose is going to be used for that attachment is not not possible in islamic uh, yeah so that's definitely one reason that as statisticians we cannot do research and be unconnected with how this research is going to be used that's i mean this is something which is called fragmentation of knowledge i am specialized in one thing and uh, that's my job and it's not my business to know what the other person is going to do I mean, it doesn't concern me i am an expert in and this is not possible so this is one difference uh what other differences are there if we compare the muslim and the rest of the religions like christianity and buddhism and some other religions they have the similar um, uh, something uh, some uh, aspects of life and some characteristics are similar in the uh, in christianity they are also believe in god and they have the same kind of things and so it doesn't seem seems like that there is a complete so there they have also the moral values and that's the that sort of things so why there is a strict a differentiation between these uh, for only for the muslims and uh, what well, is in i think that uh, this question uh, see there might be a christian approach to teaching what i'm talking the conventional approach is not based on any religion it's based on secular ideas that this is outside the scope of religion and actually one very important thing most fundamental thing the first point written here is that the what what is the meaning of knowledge itself this is under question this is most fundamental now the secular idea about knowledge is that it is objective it is factual it is concrete it is indisputable by right? this is a table everyone who is rational can agree that this is a table and there is no possible dispute there is no and and on subjective things like is this good is this moral this is subjective 
this is not concrete, this is not objective, we can disagree and there is no way to decide who is right. So, <coughs> knowledge is divided into two parts. One is the objective part on which there can be no disagreements, there can be no arguments. It is just like a number 2 plus 2 equals 4. Everybody agrees there is no Islamic or un-Islamic. So, the nature of knowledge, this is, this is what the Western concept of knowledge is, that knowledge is concrete, objective, factual, factual and uh, automatically agreed to by everybody, everybody who is rational. Now, if somebody disagrees with something, that means that they are not, not rational. And uh, implicit in this is also the message that people who are religious are not rational because they are... Uh, they are illogically rejecting things which are factual. So, uh, this already we are disputing that knowledge, this is not the nature of knowledge. Knowledge is not like that. Most human knowledge mixes facts and values and you cannot separate them. This is really the, the thing which is not well understood that in the Western tradition, they separate. They say that knowledge can be separated clearly. There are some opinions and there are facts and the two cannot be mixed. This is not true. Um, facts and opinions are mixed in such a way that you cannot separate them. So, that makes um, for um, a different understanding of what knowledge is. So somebody can can somebody explain why uh, knowledge may appear to be factual and concrete, but it automatically <coughs> builds in value judgments, subjective elements. So there is an illusion created that something is factual and objective and concrete, when in fact it is not. It is just. Uh, an opinion. Does somebody have an example? Sir, uh, the kind of use it is put into uh, may have results on morals. So, um, okay, that's yeah. correct. For example, suppose I say that I am building an atom bomb and this is just a fact. Now, an atom bomb is going to be used to kill people and you cannot isolate one thing from the other thing and say that this is just a purely technological thing I am doing and it has no implications. Obviously it has implications. If you are building a bomb then you are supporting war efforts and you are uh, saying that it is okay to kill. It's okay not to worry about any whether or not this is already a value judgment. Yeah. So, plus there are some things that are in every space and time, there are some things that are always right and always wrong, like you said, killing people. So, there are some inbuilt human um, models. Very good. I mean, this is actually another point of debate, point of uh, contention between the secular view and the Islamic view. According to the Islamic view, according to all religions, there are absolute moral values which are invariant across time and space and every person must follow them. According to the secular view, that's not true. Norms are determined by consensus. If we all agree that homosexuality is wrong, then it is wrong. But uh, ten years later, if we agree that this is right, then it becomes right. And so there is no absolute moral value. So this is another point of contention between secular and uh, Islamic views. Yes. Sir, we can say that knowledge should be useful for human beings. Yes, this is another point of contention. This is a disagreement between Western idea of knowledge and uh, Islamic idea. In Islam, you, we distinguish between useful knowledge and useless knowledge. In the West, they say all knowledge is the same. Uh, explicitly, the argument is made that if you are doing some, learning something, whether it's, um, you know, very complex mathematical models which have no apparent relation to any real world phenomena, they say, well, 
Today it's not applicable, but tomorrow somebody may, may find a use for it. So we cannot say in advance. So all knowledge is equally valuable. Actually, this comes from a background. This is not in vacuum that they are saying. It comes from the background that if you look at Bertrand Russell, who was one of the leading atheists of the 20th century and, a, and actually a propagator of his belief, he said very clearly that, you know, ultimately uh, all life was created by an accident, a cosmic accident. Some atoms came together and it will be just destroyed by an accident. There is a real, uh, big uh, supernova and everything will die. So, regardless of what we do, there is no meaning to life, whether we are heroes or whether we are cowards or whether we do great things or whether we don't. Nothing matters. Nobody is watching. So, once you have the idea that life is without purpose, then basically useful means useful with respect to some achieving some goal. But if there is no goal, then everything is the same. So all knowledge is equally valuable. So again, this is a important distinction between. So that's why, for all of these reasons, the Islamic point of view is different, and so Islamic approach to teaching and learning will be different. So today we have a strange situation that because the of this fragmentation, because of this disregard for, you know. As a Muslim teacher, I must make sure that what I'm teaching you is useful. Because I don't want to teach useful, useless knowledge. That will be a sin for me. I'm wasting students' time. That's not good. But no regard for this is given in the Western tradition. So a student can learn yani beginning macro and then intermediate macro and then advanced macro. Macro is about basically government policies and how the economy should be run. Now you take this student and you put him in the government say what you should do, he will not have the faintest idea. He has never studied. He has studied mathematical models but how to apply it, he has never studied. So um, this is because of this approach that uh, separates um, and it doesn't make a distinction between useful and useless. When I started to develop this course, and it has taken me about 10 years, I said for every fact I teach, I must go and find out how this is used in the real world. And I thought that I would find this in the books, but I couldn't. I looked, okay, here is the average and here is the median. Is there a real world application? Now, if you look through the books, there is an illusion. I mean, uh, the book gives you some data and, and applies it. So it seems like you are dealing with real data. But actually, it's just an illusion. If you go back and see, are people actually using this? If you go and see, okay, in the Olympics, people are actually evaluating performance. So what do they do? Well, they use a trimmed mean. They don't use the mean itself. So, I mean, there's something, I mean, that's a real example. So, when, when you go and look for real, real examples, not artificial real examples. So, in the textbook, you can find artificial real examples, but no real, real examples. So, when I'm developing this course, I try to make sure that I teach only those concepts that are actually used in the real world. And I found that a lot of things can be just skipped because they're not used. Actually, the Western methodology of teaching I, I give an example like this. It's uh, it's like if you teach somebody all about the technology required to manufacture a car. There's a huge amount of work. I mean, carburetor and radiator and spark plugs and uh, many many systems. But you don't teach the student how to drive. So <laughs> he can't. When you put him in the car and say, "Okay, you know everything about how this car is manufactured. Go ahead and drive." He will not have any idea. On the other hand, driving is much easier to learn. And yet, that's that's what the useful part is. Now, it doesn't mean that production technology is useless. It is useful. Of course, the car wouldn't exist if it wasn't there. But for most people, it is not useful knowledge. There is a small number of people who need to know how to manufacture and how to fix the cars. But for most people, all they need to know is how to learn how to drive. And typical statistical courses 
don't teach you how to drive. Yes. Sir, um, you could be read that lecture, and I was confused at a point. Islam says the difference gives the dif clear difference between useful knowledge and uh, not so useful knowledge. Sir, um, there was this question in the quiz as well hmm. about. Sailing ships. Sailing ships. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sir. So yes. Lots of people got that wrong. Yes. <laughs> so sir, uh, let's make explanation. Yes. Well, basically, you see, uh, there was a time when international trade was run by sailing ships. Yeah. Yani these were the things which um, <coughs> carried out trade. Uh, there was nothing else. But then the steam engine came, and sailing ship became obsolete. Now they are used for recreation and leisure, but they are not really very important anymore. So, the value of that knowledge has changed. Sir, so that's true, but uh, when we say Islam says something that's, uh, that's useful, it means it's useful for mankind, for the welfare of mankind. So, uh, when we know the technique of how to make sailing ships, it's always useful, is it not? Well, you yeah, see, um, what, what would it be used for? Transport, transport like Not these days, it's not used for transport. Sir, we have all sorts of. Uh, what? Sir, as an ASIP, it's useful and always useful. Over. That is? Selling ships, as an ASIP, it's always useful. Over. Nay, today the ships are in use, but they are not sailing ships, they are um, machine engines, steam engines. Uh, sailing ships are used only for recreation, for leisure. So, if there aren't any, it wouldn't cause any serious damage to the world. <laughs> anyway, the point was not really to... The point was to illustrate that the utility of these things, like uh, building forts, is uh, was very important at one point. It was the very important means of defense. But now it's useless. So, the value of types of knowledge, like agriculture also, our current agriculture techniques are based on tractors and fertilizers and these were not known one century ago, so it was, and, and probably will be obsolete one century later, so it's temporarily useful, but not eternally useful. Actually, the background idea is that the only eternally useful knowledge is that of the Quran and the Hadith. Okay, so um, on this page, basically what I am trying to say is that the secular conception of knowledge is different, its utility is different, um, and therefore the methodology of how you teach and also what you teach, all of these things are different. And Unlike, you know, this is this is what is not so widely realized, which is leading to a problem, is that because of this secular idea, which people absorb, that, you know, Western knowledge is purely technical and objective, so there is no conflict with Islam. So we can teach Islam on one side and Western knowledge on the other side, and there is no problem because there is no conflict. This is a problem. This is a serious problem because actually... The secular education embodies many ideas which are strongly in conflict with Islam. And when you learn these two things, they conflict with each other. So one of the ideas which is built into the Western uh, method of education is that scientific knowledge is superior to all other kinds of knowledge. So um, when we study statistics, when we study mean and median mode, we are learning something very valuable and precious, as opposed to when we study Quran and Hadith, we are learning something which is not so valuable and not so important. So, uh, this idea has to be opposed. Uh, and in order to oppose it, first you have to expose it, because it's not there uh, explicitly in the text. It's buried in the foundation. So, that's uh, why... Muslims must approach the subject differently from others. Yes. Sir, uh, would it not uh, narrow the uh, horizon 
Absolutely. A lot of people say that you should. There are lots of things in here which would be very useful for a Western audience because it is not available. Uh, but I don't have a Western audience in mind. Yes, I narrow my audience to Muslims because um, because uh, Islamic approach is different and it's only applicable in an Islamic context. So, actually, you see, every approach has its own built-in assumptions. So, when we go and learn, uh, um, um, we get acquire a secular education, then we absorb all of the assumptions which are implicit. That's also a religion. Secu secularism is also a religion and it also has its own assumptions which they teach. And uh, so we cannot follow that because many of those ideas are in conflict with Islamic ideas. And so we have to narrow the audience. Sir. Yes. Sir, uh, there is the, uh, I think there is the missing themes in lots of subjects like we, if we talk about the economics, uh, the many subjects, uh, parts of the economics, micro, macro and mathematics and statistics. So the theme, Islamic theme is missing in all those subjects uh, if we hear only for the uh, introduction statistics for the Muslims. So what about those other subjects and chemistry and natural sciences and other? So there is missing themes. So how, uh, how the other students can get the Islamic approach in those subjects? Why only the introduction to statistics for Muslims? Well, that's and a very good question and that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to launch a revolution. I am showing how it can be done in statistics and I hope that other people who are teaching chemistry will learn how to do this in chemistry and so on. Sir, uh, another question is this, sir. Can you give sir, some examples from statistics from the Islamic point of view? Yes, this whole course is uh, dealing with that. So, everything must be related to purpose. I am here, I am teaching you, you are here, you are studying why. In, in Islam, everything depends on the intention. Innam al-amal bin niyat. So it's not that... So, first of all, uh, there was... A, these intentions are not discussed in um, normal Western courses because basically, again, there was a very strong... Um, emphasis on materialism. By materialism I don't mean uh, what ordinarily people understand by it. That is, uh, you know, uh, seeking uh, wealth. Actually materialism is a philosophy which says that only material things matter. And there is no invisible. Actually it's the rejection of the ghayb. And the Quran starts with Allazina yu'minuna bil ghayb those people who believe in the unseen. In the West, there is an explicit tradition which says that if something is unseen, it doesn't exist. So, uh, because of that, I mean, there was a time when people in the West thought that when we think, you know, thought is an abstract thing, there's also a fluid secretion of the brain. So everything has to have some material manifestation. If it is not material, it doesn't exist. So, uh, intentions, these are immaterial, these are invisible, so they don't matter. Um, actually intentions are very important and uh, they matter a lot. So first we have to be clear in according to Islamic ideas and that's the most important thing. Why am I sitting here? What is my purpose? Now in the material world the idea that I am I'm uh, teaching because I will earn a salary. So, uh, okay, I don't know whether or not I'm going to get paid for this course. <laughs> uh, I haven't investigated the rules. So, similarly, your uh, typical student is uh, studying because then he will get a grade for this course and then he will get a degree and then he will get a job. And so that's the intention. So, these are not Actually, I mean, first of all, the difference between Islam and Christianity on this account. Islam is a practical religion, and in Christianity, pursuit of wealth is uh, discouraged. In Islam, 
it is not encouraged but the thing is that you are supposed to earn money to the extent of fulfilling your responsibilities and you have a responsibility to yourself to be able to feed and clothe and also you have a responsibility to those who are your kin and who are dependent upon you so earning enough money to feed and clothe and house them and educate them is required so to that extent earning money is uh, not only permissible it's actually uh, demanded by islam but it should not be the purpose of life to earn money and unfortunately many people in these times have made this the purpose of their life the purpose of my life is to earn money and that's not good so the first thing is to understand that if we do something with the right intention then it becomes an act of worship now the only for from the islamic point of view all actions of a muslim should be acts of worship so now we have to try to figure out how i can sit here in such a way with such an intention that this becomes ibadah because allah taala said that ma khalaqnal jinna wal insa illa liya'budun that we have not created man and jinn except for worship so how can we turn this uh, sitting my teaching your learning into an act of worship the, so the first thing is to correct the intentions now as i said even the intention to earn money is not uh, can be a, a act of worship provided that we understand that it's not earning infinite amounts of money for no purpose we earn money so that we can support ourselves and we are not a burden is very interesting um, the islamic reason for my earning money to support myself is not because not so much because i am reco- required to support myself it's more because i don't want to be a burden on others and this is the thing that in islam we have social responsibility if somebody is not earning anything then i have to provide food to them so there is if somebody is poor somebody is hungry somebody is sick and collectively we all have the responsibility somebody is uneducated we have the responsibility to take care of their needs as a society as a group so every responsibility is um yani islam is very symmetrically balanced if you have a responsibility the other side has a duty if i have the responsibility to help you in the time of need you have the responsibility to make sure that um you are in need only when um, you, there's nothing you can do i mean if somebody is a widow or an orphan or mm-hmm. somehow handicapped then he is mazur but if somebody can earn for himself and then he chooses to be a burden on others this is not permitted because uh, yeah that's that's just the duty that's it is because of this that we have the responsibility to help others because they are not supposed to sit and wait for help if they can do anything so if they it's only when they can't do anything that we must help them so this is a very finely balanced system now in in, in the west we talk only about one side i have this right i have this right but no responsibilities so in islam every right is matched by a responsibility if i have a right to be helped in the time of need i have the responsibility to help myself and others so they are perfectly balanced and matched so um so as i saying the the problem is what are the intentions for seeking knowledge which will make this an act of worship when well, we have to look at what are the orders of allah with respect to knowledge so allah the quran started with iqra read so um we are supposed to learn acquire knowledge by the order of allah allah taala 
um, says to actually the ayat is addressed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and says that say Rabbi zidni ilma um, say that O oh Allah Ta'ala increase me in knowledge so even the Prophet is being asked to search for increase in knowledge and we are supposed to emulate the Prophet so we are also supposed to ask for increase in knowledge so we ask Allah for more knowledge <coughs> hmm تو یہی بات ہے کہ یہ ایک سیکولر تھنکنگ ہے جو وجود میں آئی ہے جس کو مٹانے کی ہم یہاں کوشش کر رہے ہیں کہ فرسٹ آف آل دیر از نو یعنی ان اسلام وی ہیو این انٹیگریٹڈ ورلڈ ویو اٹس ناٹ دیٹ سم تھنگز آر ڈن فار دی ادر ورلڈ اینڈ سم تھنگز آر ڈن فار دس ورلڈ ایوری تھنگ از ڈن فار ون پرپز اینڈ وین وی سیک نالج سو نالج از فار ایف وی سیک نالج ود دی آئیڈیا دیٹ ود دس نالج آئی ول سرو the ummah i will serve mankind uh, and uh, this is desirable because allah taala wants us to help others then it becomes worship so this is exactly what i am trying to teach you that even if we are um, uh, studying so that we can get job this can also be worship if we understand that we will earn money in order to fulfill our social responsibilities and in order to fulfill the orders of Allah to go for Hajj and do all of these things for all of these things that we need money so even yani, as long as you are earning money for the purpose of spending it for the sake of Allah and this includes uh, earning food and housing for yourself this is also for the sake of allah then it becomes worship also that's not the only intention you can there are other in, in, in there is knowledge for self purification tazkiya so exactly if we understand that i am seeking knowledge for just for worldly benefits and now i realize that this is a mistake and now i change my intention and i say okay, okay if i earn money it will, i will use it in the way that Allah Ta'ala wants me to use it then it becomes then it's tazkiyah now I have changed a bad intention to a good intention self-purification this is part of deen uh, for spiritual advance yes sir uh, the previous slide said for the previous slide said sir man has the potential to be a sinit of me sir I will say Well, there is a there is a uh, ayat in the Quran لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ سُمَّ رَدَنَّا وَأَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ It means that man was created in the best of confirmations means that and also reduced to the lowest of the low so how I understand this ayat and uh, how it has been interpreted by some scholars but not all is that inside man there is the potential to rise higher than the angels because it's the best of creation also is the potential to be worse than the beasts so the our purpose is to try to achieve this potential which is buried within every human being it's like this that there is a seed and the seed has the potential to become a tree uh, but it doesn't automatically become a tree it has to have the right conditions and if it has to be planted and it has to have the right weather and right soil and then it will become a tree so exactly like this we are not automatically asanitakwi we are not automatically superior to the angels but inside every human being there is the potential to rise higher than the angels and so our goal in life is to achieve that potential to try to find the right circumstances and the right soil and the right uh, weather so that this potential can be achieved and realized
and also to avoid the other potential to be worse than the beast. So, there is a lot of encouragement to seek knowledge which is found in the Quran. Um, Allah Ta'ala teaches us to pray for increase in knowledge. There is a hadith that you, you should seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. And uh, there is a hadith that alim is superior to abid, like the moon is superior to the stars. So, the act of seeking knowledge is uh, more important than the act of worship. So, somebody stays and makes uh, the hajjud and ibadat all the time, and the other person is seeking knowledge, then, then the seeker of knowledge is superior. And the ink of the scholar is like the blood of a martyr. So all of these things are showing us that knowledge is important. Basically, I think I discussed this earlier also that uh, Muslims, the Arabs at that time, were very backwards, ignorant. It's called Jahiliya, the period of ignorance. Islam brought them knowledge. With this knowledge, they became leaders of the world. So obviously, it is a very powerful knowledge. And today, there is a question, is this knowledge of equal value today? Now, even in the West, people understand that Islam did lead Muslims to world leadership. So, now what they say is that that knowledge was very valuable at that time, but it is not adapted to current conditions. So, today, Islam's teachings are useless, irrelevant. And today, if we want to progress, then we want to, then we have to study statistics and chemistry and biology and physics. What I would like to say is that this is false. That today also, Islam has the solutions to all of our problems. But today, Muslims are not paying attention. It is said that Islam came as a stranger and it will become a stranger. And so it is true today that Islam is a stranger to Muslims. But the Muslims are involved in what is called Jahli Murakkab. Jahli Murakkab is compound ignorance. It means that the Muslims are... Um, ignorance is to not know something and compound ignorance is to not know something but to believe that you know it. So Muslims think that they know Islam and therefore they say, well, I already know Islam, it doesn't offer me any solution to any problem that I can see, so it's useless, let's go and find some important things and obviously Western knowledge is very important because it helped me to find jobs and, and it gives me prestige and status and all of those things. So this is actually wrong. Islamic knowledge is very powerful uh, and it has the same power today. Muslims are living very much in Jahiliya today, very much in a state of ignorance. All of the sins that were um, prevalent in the time of Jahiliya are prevalent all over the world today, including killing your own children. There is a book called uh, Mothers Who Kill Their Children, which studies thousands of such, such cases which have occurred in the USA. So, um, today, it is not that for to achieve world leadership we need, need to learn chemistry and physics. Actually today the same, same thing which led Arabs from the bottom to the top is applicable and Islam has just as revolutionary teaching today as it did 1400 years ago. But Muslims are not aware of this. So, the purpose of learning we have already um, discussed that there is a l large number of contrasts. Uh, in Islam, we seek spiritual growth. We seek to serve others. Uh, so, I acquire knowledge not because it will be beneficial to me and I will be able to exploit the ignorance of other people, 
but rather I want to serve others and help them. Um, one um, important difference, the Western idea is that knowledge should be uh, the, the scientist or the one who has knowledge should be neutral and detached. He should not be emotionally involved with the subject because that will create bias and that will um, prevent learning which must be neutral. In Islam is the opposite. In Islam says that if you look at something that is going wrong then you must try to fix it. You can't be neutral. So if there is a person he is dying of hunger so the scientist will make notes that, oh yes, his breath is coming slowly, uh, yes, his heartbeat is slowing down, yes, his eyes are turning white. While the Muslim will go and try to help him, <laughs> and he will not be able to study the conditions. At the end, you will say, okay, what were the physiological conditions? The Muslim say, I don't know, I was trying to, to give him water and pump his heart. And the scientist will say, oh yes, I have perfect notes, exactly. So, there is a difference between so, Muslims have to be, by the order of Allah, engaged. We cannot watch injustice and just describe it neutrally. Uh, at the same time, uh, what is very um, interesting is that Allah Ta'ala says that do not let your emotions uh, lead you to injustice. You have to be just even to your enemies. And you have to give witness even if it is against your own self-interest. So this is very different from Western idea. According to the West, people are naturally selfish and they cannot give evidence against themselves. So in the USA, according to the law, there is something called the Fifth Amendment which says that if you are asked to give testimony in court, and this testimony will harm your self-interest, then you don't have to give it because it's not humanly possible to go against your self-interest. So, uh, Islam says, no, you can and you should and you must. So, these are very high standards and today uh, Muslims are not following these standards. So. Um, basically the question arises that is this possible so the West saying is not possible now we cannot say that it is possible to bear witness against yourself just from theory unless we demonstrate this with our lives we cannot we cannot prove this so this is the challenge that the Muslims face that to live Islam, not to just talk about it. So I've um, started lecturing, which was not my intention. Uh, let me go back to asking questions, and let me look at um, those questions in which there was the maximum amount of confusion. So one of them was uh, the the first one, which was. Um, I think since statistics is a purely technical subject, uh, nearly everybody got that one right because uh, <laughs> there's just a few mistakes. But the next one, religion has no role to play in teaching purely technical and objective subject like statistics and it is very important in teaching subjective and spiritual. So, um, about one third of the people got this wrong. So we've been discussing this mostly for uh, uh, this lecture. Now, 
there is something to this in the sense that we do agree and there is no dispute that chemistry is not covered in the Quran and the Hadith. There is no uh, formula for uh, H2O and there is no description in Quran and Hadith about how to solve the quadratic equation and how to find the mean, the median and the mode of a list of numbers. So obviously there is some knowledge. I mean it's not, we're not saying that religion encompasses all of knowledge. Uh, first of all, one one issue is that there are some temporary types of knowledge which are uh, useful. Uh, but what we are saying is that how to use knowledge, how to teach knowledge, to understand whether it's useful or not, uh, we have to have Islam. For example, just like uh, any Islamic teachings influence. So for example, if you're learning how to make poison, um, should we teach it? Actually, suppose that I am teaching chemistry and I have a formula which, the, uh, which, which, is, um, which creates a poison that doesn't have any taste or flavor and it kills people and it doesn't leave any trace. Should I teach this in the class or not? Now, according to the West, there is no harm. It's knowledge is knowledge. But according to Islamic teachings, I will analyze uh, who is my audience, why am I teaching this, will they use this in a bad way, will the girls go and poison their mother-in-laws. <laughs> so, all of these things I have to take into account. I can't just teach it and say, well, how they other people use it is up to them. So, um, Islam, and of course, what is moral and what is immoral? This is taught by Islam. So we can't, any religion does involve us in purely technical and purely objective subjects. We have to, we have to have some, any religion tells us how to teach it, what to teach and also it says that we are responsible for what we teach. If I teach something harmful and people use it for harmful purposes, you remember that there is a story in the Quran about uh, two angels, Harut and Marut. Who knows the story? Yes? No? Somebody knows the story. No? Two angels were sent down by Allah Ta'ala as a test and they taught people knowledge and they said that, look, this knowledge is harmful. Don't... Uh, take it from us, but people would come. And what, what was the knowledge? Basically it was the knowledge of how to put fitna, how to separate couples and how to cause enmity between people. So some people, I mean it's very useful for some people to create enmity and to separate couples. And so people learned it even though, although locally it was useful to them and it helped them achieve some worldly goal, it was very harmful to them for their akhirah, but they did not know this. So, um, approach to knowledge has to be uh, is influenced by Islam. So, in this question also there were a lot of wrong answers. All human knowledge is acquired by the use of our five senses and the faculty of reason. Um, this is exactly the standpoint, the, the fundamental Western idea of objective knowledge. That You see, the five senses are, according to them, um, indisputable. Everybody can agree, what I see, what I can touch. These are common, objective. There is there's not going to be any disagreement. And then, of course, we can use our logic to put this together. And so, they say that this is this is knowledge. Everything else, I mean, I may have a feeling, I may have an intuition. This is not knowledge. So, uh, how come sixteen people said that this is correct? There are other types of knowledge. What other types of knowledge are there?
What type of knowledge is something which is not acquired by our five senses and logic? Yes? Our faith and knowledge. Yes, Allah, the uh, ilham is revealed knowledge. Knowledge that was revealed that Allah Ta'ala says they are angels and we believe it because Allah Ta'ala said it. We have no evidence for it. It's not, uh, it's not empirical knowledge. Now, actually, I think that there is something to be said here that is might need cl- clarification because when we say faculty of reason, we use it in Islam in a different way from the way that it is used in the West. So, for example, I can say that, well, if it is written in the Quran, then it's reasonable for me to believe it. <laughs> so, that's uh, quite correct. And yet, um, when um, West says faculty of reason, they mean certain logical like deductions like geometry and mathematics. That's um, And it's not the, the logic that we are using in believing in ilham and wahi is not the same type of logic. So there is some room for confusion here. So a restriction, you see, there is certain type of knowledge which is not just based on the five senses and the faculty of reason. One of the most important types of knowledge is experience. I learned how to drive. I have experience. Now, this is actually acquired by my own personal experience, but it is not objective in the sense that I can't share it with you. I can't give you my experience. You have to experience it yourself. And so it's not objective knowledge of the type that is acceptable as scientific knowledge, but it is one of the most important types of knowledge all of us have. And so, ruling this out of the picture has led to a very um, distorted understanding of what knowledge is and has caused much damage. Okay, so... This one also a lot of people got wrong. The some of the intentions are desirable and some are not. To acquire expertise is a desirable intention because actually Islam make teachings say that when a Muslim a moment does a job, he does it well. So, having competence in the job that you're doing, whatever it is you're doing, whether you are um, fixing automobiles or whether you are um, running the show, there's a Junaid Jamshed once uh, went to Raivind, at that time he was still a singer. So, he was introduced to the elders and uh, somebody said, you know, he's a very, um, he's a top singer. So, Junaid Jamshed said that I thought to myself that now we'll get a reprimand and a rebuke. So actually, the elders were very taken aback that he's a very good singer. And he said, well, it is the characteristic of a moment that whatever he does, he does very well. So, <laughs> so he was very happy that they had not rejected his uh, talent. So, even though it was in the wrong direction. So, um, to acquire expertise is uh, desirable. To appreciate the wonders of Allah as displayed in the world, this is definitely a good intention for the seeking of knowledge. There is a story about um, Watson, who was one of the discoverers of the uh, double helix, the 
pattern of uh, molecules that are uh, used in the reproductive process. So he said, and this is, you can find this quote on the internet in many places, he said that, you know, when I first saw this mechanism, what is this mechanism? Basically there's a, if you can think of it, it's the, probably you've all seen it, it's, you have a ladder shaped two, two strands on the sides and then links between them. So it's like a ladder, but it's coiled. So that's the DNA molecule. It's coiled and then it starts coming apart. See, the basic problem is how does something replicate? One becomes two. So this starts coming apart. So there is a ladder which is half open. So there is uh, one, one, one side and the other side and both of them have little steps sticking out. It, it breaks up. And now uh, molecules come and join and at the t so the, the step is completed and the other side is completed and it keeps uncoiling and new molecules attach. And he said that, you know, when I saw this, it was so fantastic. It was such an amazing uh, construction that I said that this cannot happen by itself. Someone must have created this. But unfortunately, he didn't get the Tawfiq for Iman. So later on he wrote a book. It's a very interesting book. I have cited it somewhere. It says that that much we can be sure that life did not originate by an accident on this planet. So now how can it be? Well, he had this theory of panspermia. He said that some advanced civilization came into existence. This will explain how. And then they sent rocket ships with the basic building blocks of life all over the universe, seeding the universe. So one of these rocket ships landed here and it had some basic organic molecules which can be used to start life. So he was so strong that everything, every explanation is possible except the explanation that there is God. <laughs> so, so he had to come up with this fantastically ridiculous theory in order to explain how life originated because one thing is clear that it didn't do, uh, originate by accident. Sir? Yes. Sir, what does Islam say about theories evolution? <laughs> well, you see, evolution is not one theory. There is a large group of theories. Yes. So what one is called uh, microevolution. So within a species, changes can happen. It can become taller. It can and then there is the macroevolution, which is that one species can change into another species. Now, there is a lot of empirical evidence for microevolution, that is, changes happen in species, uh, they grow taller, they grow shorter. So far, there is no evidence for macroevolution, that is, one species somehow changing into another species. The idea that one species could change into another species was... Um, Steady, yeah, that was what Darwin thought. But uh, all of the things that he said would be found, like the missing links, were not found. So basically, the whole idea is in question. But the point is exactly like Watson's problem. We know that some species were not in existence earlier and came into existence later. So now the question is how? Either God put them there. If not, then it must have evolution must have happened. Now, how it happened? We don't know, but we have faith. We have faith that there is no God. So then that convinces us that there we must have evolution. Now exactly how evolution works, nobody knows. You need the first, the most uh, elementary life form is a cell. A cell is so enormously complicated that nobody says that this came into being all by itself. It's not possible. It's just so... It's like more complicated than New York City, all of its factories and all of its industries. Volumes of, volumes of books are written on different mechanisms which operate within the cell. And it's the simplest life form. There's nothing simpler than that. So now either we have faith in God that God created the cell, or we have faith, and this is what, um, in an unseen process, so what the scientists do is they say that, well, there were these simple sulfur-based or 
water-based life forms, which of which there is no evidence, and then they gradually became more complicated, and eventually they formed a cell, and then the cell was so efficient that it destroyed all of these primitive life forms, leaving no evidence for its creation. <laughs> so this is a this is a belief in unseen of the highest order. <laughs> Any, uh, but but on uh, these primitive life forms, which must have existed in order to get to a cell, because otherwise we can't explain how the cell came into existence. So, um, so we have um, Islamic methodology for teaching is different from. Western methodology. Oops, I went back to the slides. Let me go back to the questions and try to clarify them. So, to use knowledge to serve mankind, obviously, that's ah, there's a sophist. Uh, I mean, um, subtlety here that uh, the. <coughs> It's not just service that is required. I mean, we are asked to serve people, but if it is like the generous man, he spends his money on others. But it must be for the love of Allah. It cannot be for the love of popularity or fame. <coughs> and so, this is another difficulty that if we seek popularity, if we seek fame, then these are not acceptable. So, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran that they feed others out of the love of Allah. So, it's just, it's not enough to just feed others. We have to have the right intention feeding others because Allah Ta'ala wants us to do this. So, this is a subtlety. And uh, so, if it is done in that, for that reason, then it's good, otherwise, it's not. So, when it says that the basic responsibility of the teacher is to make sure that the students understand the subject, well, actually, um, the rules for teachers are very strict. The Islamic etiquette, adab for teaching. So, first thing I have to understand as a teacher is that my students are all very precious, very important. I cannot waste their time. If I come to class late, this is, means that uh, I uh, do not provide, I do not care enough about the time of my students. Now, I have to understand that all of my students are potentially capable of changing the world. And it is my job as a teacher to try to develop this potential, to try to understand try to make you understand how important you are. Because in the materialist worldview, the materialist worldview teaches us that we are insignificant. And if you think about Newton's laws, then the effect of an object is dependent on its mass and velocity. Now my mass is about 80 kilograms and uh, I don't move very fast. And this world is billions of tons. So I can't have much of an impact, no matter what I do, no matter how I spend my life, I'm just a little insect in, in a big... So there's nothing I can do, so I should concern only with myself, with my own life. That's, that's the best. This is materialist thinking, because... Now the Quran says that if you save one life, it is as if you have saved the whole world. Now the Quran does not exaggerate. I mean, Allah Taala in another place, you mentioned that the Shu'ara, Surah Shu'ara, is said that the shair, the, the poets are bad because they exaggerate a lot. So obviously, Allah Taala does not exaggerate. What means? What this means is that every human being has the potential to change the lives of large numbers of people. We can have an impact on the whole world. It will not be by the physical means because the Newton's laws are perfectly valid. Uh, it's not our mass and velocity which is negative, but it is 
ideas, it is vision, it is spirituality. These things make a difference. And if you see the lives of people, you see, this is exactly the opposite of the lesson that is being taught in the Western world that I studied this, that uh, basically you see the destiny of a nation depends on the geography, the material resources that it has. If it is, if it is lots of natural resources, then they will become rich and they will. But actually if you look at what happened, if you look two centuries ago, Brazil and, and Russia and uh, North America and Australia and so these are the big land masses. Roughly speaking, they have India. They have about the same in terms of natural resources, in terms of agricultural lands, in terms of many. But there, if you look at the development trajectory, it's extremely different. So it means that the natural resources are not the controlling factors. It's not the material means at your disposal that determines what will happen to you. And if you look at the, the greatest examples, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to a place which was barren, a desert. There were no natural resources. The people were backward and ignorant, the most backward people on the planet. And he did not provide them with any material resources. He did not bring any guns or technology or any anything material. What he brought them was spiritual knowledge. And with this knowledge, they changed the world. The course of history was changed. So knowledge is very powerful. Our vision, our ideas, our goals are very important and we can change the world. So uh, we have to understand that we have the potential. Unless we realize that we can do things, we will not try for them. You will try only, uh, you will get only what you seek, you will get only what you try for. If you try for something very simple, uh, very easy, very cheap, then you will, that's what you will get. So today, a major problem with the Ummah of Muslimin is that we are seeking very small goals. Every person has the goal of building his own personal life and uh, who, who cares about others. So, According to this, if we have petty goals, then we will achieve petty results. So if we have a big vision, then the impact of our actions will be in accordance with our vision. The first thing is to raise your sights. Be somebody. You have only one chance to live. Make, make, it, uh, make it glorious. Make it fantastic. Don't make it ordinary. So this is the thing that the job of the teacher is to uh, inspire students to make sure that they do their best to excel and to have a big vision, not not to be cheap, not to be for sale. Actually, today the truth is that the children, students are taught to be commodities on the market. If a student comes and and um, uh, he is offered a job by a multinational for a hundred thousand dollars, he says, okay, I'm ready. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm for sale. Well, literally, this is true. They think that their lives can be purchased for money. This is a mistake. You are more precious. All the gold in the world cannot buy you. There's, there has been nobody like you before on this planet and there will be nobody like you again. Your experiences are unique. And there are unique things that you can do that nobody else can do. So you have to understand that you're not for sale. I met a, a expatriate of Pakistani, of American Pakistani. He, came, he was here a few years ago. He, he was here doing some job for some multinational. And he told to me, I, I didn't uh, ask him. He was, I think, feeling guilty. He said that, you know, I'm doing this in Pakistan and I know it's harmful for Pakistan but what can I do? I'm being paid very well and if I didn't do it somebody else would. So this is his excuse. He has been purchased for money and now he does whatever they tell him to do. This is not, I mean, if we are not for sale then it doesn't matter how much money they give us. We will not do anything which is harmful to the interests of the people and we would prefer to 
you know, I was uh, saying something like this and uh, to somebody, he said that, look, you and who else, Annie? You are so, uh, you are so weak and the forces of oppression and the forces which are, uh, are, are so strong. So we have no option, we have to join them. Actually, this is the cruel choice that was faced by our ancestors in the period of colonialism. A very difficult choice. Either you starve or you join the colonials in oppressing the rest of the people and then you can be rich. So either you betray your own nation and your own heritage and everything and then you can be rich or you suffer. But this is a very tough choice and this choice which is always there. So it's a it's a question of taste. I would rather Yani why Tipu Sultan Nikata ke live one day as a lion or for a hundred years as a jackal. So which would you prefer? So I would like to say that uh, yes, we can have a short life as and we can suffer with the people if uh, we don't want to sell out. Basically that's so this is the job of the um, teacher to bring out the potential of the students to make uh, learning possible, facilitate. It's not actually to teach the subject. The subject, you see, learning the subject requires struggle on your own part. I cannot do it for you. I can only encourage you to do it, but you have to do the struggle yourself. There is a ayat in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّمْ سُبُلِنَا that those who struggle in us, we guide them to our pathway. So, uh, this has a very action-oriented approach. Knowledge is given in the process of the struggle. You cannot acquire knowledge passively. I am telling you, you are listening and now you have le learned something. No. Unless you struggle, it will, you will not own this knowledge. To own the knowledge, you have to work on it. So, for example, I am telling you many ideas which conflict with things that you have been told. Now you have heard them. You have not understood what I have said. To understand it, uh, one technique is to try to convey this message to others. Say that our professor is saying this. What do you think? Try to discuss, to explain, to say that I didn't agree with this. What do you think? If you, if you ex discuss and try to explain it to others, then you will, in the process of this, you will understand it much better what I am telling you because now you are trying to you are struggling with this and it, uh, so uh, for the teacher I as a teacher my responsibility is to make sure that everything I teach you is useful knowledge because teaching useless knowledge will be haram will be prohibited but how do I know actually uh, there is whole stock of western knowledge and they don't differentiate so I have to be very careful I have to select the good things and have to avoid the poisons and I have done this over it's taken me 10 years to um, work out what is useful and what is useless and it has been very helpful in the sense that because I understood this issue about driving versus technology I found out that a lot of things can be discarded they are not needed to teach students so I have picked out very carefully uh, those things which are important and I have discarded a lot of things which are not important. So, uh, the course is very efficiently packed on topics which are of uh, importance. So, uh, similar to rules for uh, teachers, there are also rules for students. So, um, these are um, covered in this slide. So we have to seek knowledge with humility. These are quite different from Western 
models for learning and I had great difficulty because I learned the Western models for learning first and uh, they seemed quite efficient to me at that time. So when I found out that the Islamic teachings and all this are different, I was uh, surprised and I couldn't understand. So for example, in the West they teach us that you have to be aggressive and assertive and confident and bold and ask questions. Don't accept anything on authority. Uh, in Islam, this, there is a balance. I mean, some things you accept on authority, but other things you have to question that even when you question, there are certain rules for questioning that you must follow. Uh, in some cases people ask questions just to create controversies. And so if you are sincere and if you have a problem, then you should ask it. And uh, in fact, it is important to, if you have a question, that you should expose it. And this is very different from um, just taking everything on faith. I am just a human being. As far as uh, Wahi is concerned, you have to take it on faith. But uh, what I am saying, it can easily be wrong. And so if you find something that is wrong, you are most welcome to try to correct me as uh, many students. And I am continuously learning from my students when they uh, when I went to the quiz and I found that some questions had been answered correctly, I changed the question because I realized that it was ambiguous. Even now, some of the questions are ambiguous and if you interpret them in a different way, you can come to a different answer. I have certain thing in mind when I ask the question, but the student understands something else from it. So, that's that's the end of the lecture and more or less the end of time but uh, there are a few minutes left and if there's anything else that somebody wants to ask a question I would be happy to learn yes uh, that is clear that Islamic ideas and rules are more superior than other but if we see the conventional economics in the past that uh, two or three decades before that the main ideas was that that to produce more and more to generate more and more profit but nowadays the idea is changed like uh, some extent uh, mean that the conventional uh, economics now is struggling to enter the boundary of Islamic ideas and rules like we take the example of uh, environmental economics that the before we were thinking to create more profit and more production now we struggle that yes the production is good for the economy but we should care take um, we should take care of other as well like the concept of externality if we create a negative externality that person or that sector should pay a tax for it if it pay or it produce a positive externality then the government or the other sector pay some compensation to it then we can say that the conventional economics is now struggling to move towards the Islamic ideas Right. Well, first of all, obviously they don't think of themselves as moving towards Islamic ideas. We might um, conceive of it in this way, but certainly it's not their idea. Second of all, they had a wrong idea that we should go after growth. They saw a lot of damage coming from that. Now they are trying to control the damage. but. What if the idea itself is basically wrong? And that's what I would like to say there. Yani, uh, uh, because they were pursuing the wrong goals, they came to a lot of harm. They realized this harm. 
and they are trying to fix it. But they are very far from understanding the true extent and nature of the harm. And even now, you know, the climate control and the environmental change, the, what is being done today is not sufficient to solve the problem. There is a huge amount of disaster and catastrophe that has been created, large number of species destroyed that can never be uh, undone. The harm that has been done is forever. And why? Well, the basic concept is that the concept of private property in the West is that something which belongs to me, I can do with it whatever I want. I don't have to worry about others. Whereas in Islam, the concept of property is a trust. It has been given to me for safekeeping and I have to make sure that I pass it on to the future generations. Because this concept was lost, huge amount of environmental damage was done. It's still lost. Now they are just trying to do damage control to the extent that while we live, we don't suffer from it. And who cares about what happens to posterity? And because of this, um, sufficient effort is not being done because of lack of morals, lack of understanding, lack of uh, lack of the idea of justice to the future generations. So, although they are coming to an understanding which is closer to Islamic ideas, they are very far from it and they will never reach. <laughs> Sir? Yes. Sir, like uh, we were discussing that uh, we seek knowledge for the sake of good job. But as a Muslim, we believe in faith. We believe in faith. That is uh, your risk that is written in your faith and you get what is written in your faith. Yes. Then uh, uh, it's insignificant that we are saying that if we get good degrees, then we get a good job. So how do you understand? Well, faith is a very complicated uh, subject. So. Uh, I could not there is a um, there are many paradoxes associated with it that um, yes, yes so whatever is written for us we also have to struggle for that at the same time that is also written for us <laughs> Right and wrong paths are there, and you have to choose what is the right yes. and the wrong path. Faith has to do with the uh, ilm of God, not with the <coughs> jabr. Allah does not force us to follow certain paths, He just knows which paths we are going to choose. That's what faith is. So that doesn't mean, see, it's like this that. If you see a movie, then you can s tell what this guy is going to do, what he is going to say. But that doesn't mean that the person who was uh, acting in the drama he wasn't free. Although he had, he had, to, he he could, he could make mistakes in saying the lines. He could choose to say something different from what was written in the script and many other things. So he had the choice. He made certain choices. But anyway, now it's sealed. Now see, Allah Ta'ala has seen everything from the beginning to the end, so he knows exactly what we are going to do. But it doesn't interfere with our freedom to make the choice. When we are facing with the situation, we are free to choose. The fact that Allah, it's written what you will do, doesn't mean that we are going to be compelled to do this regardless of what we want to do. No. Actually, we made a choice and, and Allah Ta'ala knows the choice that we made. But we still had freedom to choose. So that's... Alright, that's all for today. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanallah,